This push for the Indigenous voice and its gathering steam. Last week, of course, we saw the machinery legislation, so not the actual question, but all the, uh, the, the nuts and bolts, if I can call it that, come into the parliament. Not passed, just introduced. And, of course, so we had Linda Burney, the Indigenous Minister, say they will not, the government, fund a yes or a no campaign. Instead, though, there's $200 million of your money on the table for a whole lot of other things. They're calling it community education to counter what will be misinformation about the voice vote. Here was Linda Burney last week. We will be using public funds to fund a civics campaign so people know about what referendums are, uh, people understand uh, what uh, the Constitution is about. We will not be using public funds to fund a yes or a no campaign. We believe those campaigns can raise their own money. Well, clear as mud about what that $200 is going to do. Someone will help us uh, pull it all apart. Northern Territory CLP Senator Jacinta Price, who joins me now. Um, I'll, I'll get into the rancour, Jacinta, directed towards you, but you've been a good study on the numbers here. $235 million is the exact amount. Some's contingency reserve, some is specified funding, but there's a big quantum of money there. Are you confident this is going to be used fairly or are you, like me, fearing it's going to be used to basically backdoor the argument for the yes vote and basically um, do everything they can to cancel the no vote? That's exactly what this money is being used for. Um, you know, we have organisations like the NIAA that are already pretty much pushing um, the uh, constitutional change, uh, the yes vote. We have, you know, it's being pushed upon the public service. People in the public service are, um, are, are being pushed toward uh, voting yes for constitutional change. The, the statement from the heart is being weaponised and used as emotional blackmail to you know, get people on board with the yes vote. You know, their campaign has been underway for some time already. So, of course, they don't need... Um, they don't need to fund a yes and a no vote because they've already got their yes campaign bankrolled. Uh, and and as many you know many times you will hear uh, the minister herself talk about uh, and her assistant minister Melendry McCarthy talk about uh, the corporations and the organisations that have signed up and that have come on board. Uh, you know big corporates that are signing on to the Uluru statement without really really truly knowing what it all means and what those consequences might look like uh, for our marginalised. This is a top-down approach. This is not about a grassroots movement um, for people on the ground. Uh, you know, if, if, if this is what they're trying to sell, that's certainly not the case at all. And given that, you know, there's already millions of dollars being poured into uh, what their claim is going to be uh, about educating Australians, it's nonsense. It's all about... It's all about funding the yes campaign in other ways and letting the no campaign sort of fend for itself and um, rely on the generosity of the Australian people to get behind. We've got $235 million already in the bank there for the government to spend as it sees fit. We know in this machinery legislation introduced last week that the AEC, the Electoral Commission, will no longer send out the yes and the no case, as they have in previous referendum uh, referenda. We also know, too, going back to the Republic one in 1999, $7.5 million public money was given to the yes campaign, $7.5 million to the no campaign. But importantly, then a prohibition that could be no other fundraising, no big corporates, uh, uh, no uh, Simon Holmes of Court types uh, wanting to influence the decision. That's all that was there to inform Australians to then make up their own mind. You are going to have a situation, and I know corporates have already had their meetings, they will spend tens of millions of dollars on this yes case. They've all got tax deductibility. Uh, there's no level playing field, Jacinta. 
Absolutely not. Uh, and, and there's also um, the entity uh, Indigenous Australians for Constitutional Recognition, which had previously been knocked back by the ACNC in 2021 uh, for... Um, for DGR status, so they could be, uh, so they could obviously take donations and and offer those tax deductions to those donors. They were previously knocked back mm. in 2021. Um, they were going to take the ACNC to court over that matter, but withdrew. Uh, this government has, uh, in the under their own discretion, um, provided them with um, DGR status. Uh, you know, it, it, it's everything... They're putting everything together in favour of the Yes campaign. This is not... If, if this legislation passes uh, and if the legislation to then carry out a referendum passes, this will not be a mm. fair referendum. As the Australian newspaper reports today, the government, quote, is increasingly unlikely to put out a detailed plan on how the voice would work before next year's national vote. One of The Voice's key supporters, Professor Megan Davies, says, and I'll quote again, going out with a fully-fledged detail is dangerous because the nation needs to vote on the amendment, not the model. As if anyone should be asked to vote on something without knowing what precisely that something is. Another Voice supporter, Professor Tom Calmer, says the detail will only be decided, quote again, once the referendum passes. Clearly what voice advocates want is for voters to give them a blank cheque where they can then fill in the amount later. Now, does that make sense to you? It shouldn't because it's wrong. This is our nation's founding document. We don't ask politicians in the parliament to vote for something that isn't spelt out clearly in the legislation, yet that's what these politicians expect from you. Remember the words that the Albanese government wants to put into our constitution. There shall be a voice, it says, and that it may make representations to the parliament and the executive government on matters relating to Indigenous people. That's all they're telling us. And believe me, in legislation, the simpler the sentence, the more open-ended it is and the bigger the truck you can drive through it. So if it passes, there will be a voice, whatever that is, however it's elected, and it may make representations to the parliament and the government about anything at all to do with Aboriginal people, which, of course, is everything. And because it's entrenched in the Constitution, the High Court will sit in judgment on whether the government has adequately allowed these representations to be made. As the Prime Minister himself says, only a brave government would ignore the voice's advice. Yet we're expected to vote on this voice without knowing anything for sure. How it'll be selected, who'll be part of it, who'll vote for it, how it'll be funded, how much funding it will get paid for, of course, by you, and how this whole business of making representations would work. More and more, it all brings to mind Paul Keating's advice. If you don't understand it, don't vote for it. And if you do understand it, you'd never vote for it anyway.